you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Of course, we'll have uh, on the screen uh, copies also. Tonight, I want to talk to you about obeying God's call. Obeying God's call. Uh, let me give you the outline, and there are outlines back there. Yeah, I forgot, we have some guests. Uh, if y'all want some outlines, where'd, where'd Lonnie go? Will you get them? Hey, Robert. Never mind. <laughs> if, if you want an outline that you can just jot down there, just if you'll raise your hand, we'll get them to you, okay? It's great to have. We have four guests here tonight, and that is such a, isn't that great? That's such a blessing. Uh-huh. On our outline, number one, God called Moses to lead, okay? God called Moses to lead. Uh, we will leave these on the board for just a couple of minutes. And the second one is Moses makes uh, five excuses, okay? God calls Moses to lead. Moses makes five excuses. And the last one is Mo Moses obeys the voice of the Lord. Moses obeys the voice of the Lord. Father, thank you for this night. And God, I thank you for your word. And God, I pray you be with us as we look at your word tonight. And God, your word is always yes, and it's amen. And God, we just thank you for that. So God, I pray that you would just uh, open our minds and our hearts uh, to what you want to say tonight. Uh, God, I pray that we would uh, obey any call that you give in our lives. God, we love you, we praise you, and God, we just thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, everyone knows the story of Moses' birth, uh, you know, and all that uh, went on there, and uh, we praise the Lord for that. God had his hand on Moses uh, since birth, uh, but I want to pick up in chapter 3, Exodus 3, verse 1, okay? Uh, God calls Moses to lead. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he, and he led the flock back to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And we know, uh, you know from Scripture uh, that Moses uh, you know, got angry uh, when he was a young man and he slew an Egyptian. Uh, he had to flee and uh, ran, and uh, he'd basically been in Midian, Midian uh, for 40 years. And uh, Horeb, you know later on, uh, that, that is where Moses later on, uh, you know, the hand of God carved out the Ten Commandments there. Now look at verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. Folks, uh, when you see the capital angel, uh, that is a good indication that, uh, you know, it, it, it is Jesus incarnate, okay? He came, he was there, he was, he was on the call uh, to Moses. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And especially in those days, you know, depending on, you know, whether the bush is dry or, you know, the area was dry, uh, but it had burned for a long time, and so uh, Moses, I'm sure, was wondering, why is this bush uh, not burning? It says in verse 3, that Moses said, Now I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the, bu why the bush does not burn. Verse 4, so when uh, the Lord saw that he turned aside uh, to look, God called him from the midst of the bush. Can you imagine God just speaking out loud to you? and calling your name, that's a pretty cool thing. Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. <clears throat> I love those three words. Uh, folks, God speaks to us all the time. Uh, God speaks to us through his word. God speaks to us through prayer. Uh, here, it was a literal voice from heaven. And Moses had a great answer. Here am I. And, he said, and then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off of your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Folks, I'm telling you, he was the 
in the presence of God Almighty. All right? I, I, and again, I believe all three were there. I believe the Trinity was there at that time. God the Father, God the Son, the angel, and God the Holy Spirit. In verse 6, moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And folks, I'm telling you, uh, when you are in the presence of God, when you sense that presence, there is an awe of God. There is a reverence of God. And Moses knew something supernatural was happening. Look at verse 7. And the Lord said, I have uh, surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of the taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up from the land uh, to good and large land and a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come, and I have seen the oppression with them uh, which uh, the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, I will send you to Pharaoh <clears throat> that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So we see God's call for Moses to lead. And you, you know, in the, the second thing we see is Moses' five excuses. When we have something, you know, uh, a call of God like this on our lives, uh, a lot of times we even question. I, I mean, when you think an audible voice and God speaking to you, you're just thinking, man, what is going on here? What, what is he talking about? Because I tell you what, sometimes we let our past uh, get in the way. And uh, you, you can see here, there were five reasons uh, that Moses thought, you know, God, you must be mistaken. You must be mistaken. And I think one of the ones that probably haunted him more than others was his past. See, he had to flee Egypt because he murdered a guy. Okay, And so I'm sure there was that fear in his life that, hey, if I go back there, you know, what, you know, what if those guys, what if, what if people recognize me? And folks, 40 years is a long time, all right? Uh, and, and even in my own life, you know, I, I go back to Lawton and I'll go back to my hometown, but people still recognize me. If I'm out, or especially when I go to church, at the church I grew up in, and so I'm, I'm sure this, this fear came up in Moses' mind because of his past. Now look at verse 11. Excuse number one, but Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So basically, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think he was, you know, trying to be overly humble. I think he was just simply saying, Hey, I've spent the last 40 years uh, you know, shepherding and, and out in the middle of the desert. You are asking me to go back, okay, and lead and, and probably up to this point somewhere between 1.5 and 2 million uh, people out of Egypt. And so there had to be this probably lack of confidence. And he simply says, who am I? And, and really what he was saying was, I'm a nobody. I'm sure you can do better than this, all right? Uh, and and, you know, God would not take that answer, I promise you. Folks, if you think about that, God used nobodies all the time. Think of Gideon, okay? He was a farmer, all right? And God used him mightily. And, and all through the Word of God, you can see God using people. Uh, what he's looking for is availability, okay? People that will say the thing that Moses said initially, here am I. So we see the first excuse is I'm a nobody. And then in verse 13, we see the second excuse. And then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel, say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they will say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And he, he, he was basically saying, All these people really don't know me. Okay, we, I, I know they're God's chosen people, but who, who made me leader? 
Who made me in charge? Okay, by what authority am I coming? And then I love his answer. God, God gives to Moses in verse 14, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me. Hey, we've studied the I am's of the seven I am sayings in, in, you know, in John, the gospel of John. Okay, I, I am the way, the truth, and the light. I am the shepherd. Okay, I am. And so basically what he is saying is, I tell them that I am the God, Jehovah of this Bible has sent you. Folks, I'm telling you, I, I realize that a lot of times kings send people as representatives. But folks, we are talking about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're talking about the God of the heavens. And if the God of heavens enlists you, I'm just telling you, and, and I really believe this, folks, God will give you everything you need to fulfill that mission. Folks, he's looking for people that are available, people that will say yes, uh, people that, that will, will depend on him for everything. Now, verse 15, moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has, has sent me to you. What was he doing? He's, he was going back to Old Testament history to where it all began. And folks, I'm telling you, Abraham was the father of faith. And you start throwing his name around, okay? I mean, to me, God's name is enough. When he said, God sent me, that would be the end of the story. But he's saying, these people know historically these folks, and that who has, is who has sent me. And this is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord your God of the fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, appeared to me. I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and all the ones we said earlier, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will heed your voice and you shall come to you. You shall, come, you shall come, and you and the elders of Israel to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord. So his first excuse was, I'm a nobody. The second was, the excuse was, I don't know your name. I'm, you know, I mean, he knew who God was, but he was really doubting not God's authority, but God giving him that authority. He could have chose anyone to lead the children of Israel, but he chose Moses. Verse 19, but I am now sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders. And folks, we know the ten plagues. We know the miracles that God did which I will do in its midst. And after uh, that, he will let you go. And I will give this uh, people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be when you go that you should not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells in her house, articles of silver and gold and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, and you shall plunder the Egyptians." So he's saying, not only are you going to lead them, but I am going to provide things for you as you go. So we see the excuse, I'm a nobody. Excuse number two, I don't know your name. Excuse number three, they won't believe me. Look at verse, or chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered and said, Suppose they will not believe me or listen to my vo voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said unto him, what is in your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it to the ground. So he cast it to the ground, and it became a serpent. This is the first miracle. This was a proof that God was in this. This is proof that God was going to be with them. Folks, that's just not a normal thing. You don't have a rod or a staff and, and just throw it on the ground, and it turns into a snake or a serpent. And Moses fled from it. 
And by the way, I flee from snakes. I don't care. It can be a garden snake. It can be whatever snake it is. When there's a snake, I'm out of here. All right? Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail, which had been a real challenge on my part. If I was in Moses' shoe, I would have to totally depend on God. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said, and again, he gives us next example just to authenticate it, just to say, okay, this is a miracle, but I've got another one for you. Now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Well, folks, if you read through Leviticus, which I have several times, there's nothing good about leprosy, okay? I mean, you were, you were outcast, you were unclean. It was not a good thing. Verse 7, and he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like the other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of your first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry land, and the water which you will take from the river will become blood on the dry land. What, what was he land? What was he saying? He said. This, and of course we know that was one of the ten plagues. So he's saying if they don't believe these first two things, they will believe this. So as we see in verse uh, 10, we see the fourth excuse. They won't believe me was the last one, and this one is, I'm not a good speaker. And by the way, I like to tell this, uh, I did not like speech class. I had to take one in ninth grade. And I'm telling you, I was so nervous. Every speech I gave, it was terrible. Uh, you know, I, I, I stuttered a little bit. I, I, I had trouble staying on focus. And then I got all the way through college, and I took speech in college my last semester of my senior year, okay, because that's how bad I did want to. Matter of fact, the, the speech guy, uh, my teacher, my professor, was the debate coach. And I'm telling you, he used to make ladies cry, ladies with speeches, and he'd, he'd critique them, and he literally made ladies cry, all right? And, and so anyway, I say all this to say you can't use this as an excuse, all right? Because I got a C in speech in college, and here's what he said, you'll never make a public speaker. That's what my professor told me when I was, when I was fixing to graduate. And you know what? For a while, I, I believed that. Okay, but isn't it neat how God, when he has a plan for you, he makes it happen, folks. He makes it happen. I'm not eloquent of speech, or neither since, uh, since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow to speech and slow to tongue. For the Lord said in him, who makes man's mouth, or who makes the mute or the deaf or the seen or the blind? Have I not the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. I think of some of these singers, all right? I can't remember the country singer that stuttered all the time. Thank you. But when he sang a song, you just sit there, wow, that's amazing. Folks, God can do anything he chooses to do. God can use, I'm just telling you, he can take anyone and use them for the glory of God. And the fifth excuse, uh, number five, basically was saying, hey, anybody else would be a better pick. Anybody, you just choose them, that would be a better pick than I. Look at verse 13, and he said, my Lord, please send by the hand of whom else you may send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. I mean, I could see where God would get mad, all right? He's given him all these things and all this proof and Moses was giving him all the excuses of why he couldn't do what God asked him to do. Folks, if God's with us, we can do it. There's nothing we can't do with God by our side. And it says, uh, is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out 
uh, to meet you. And when he sees you, you will be glad in he, uh, you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and uh, with his mouth, and I will teach you what to say. What is he saying? Man, I'll give you the words. It's like when we witness to somebody, folks. I'm telling you, it's not our words. It's the word of God, and it's the words from God. He's just looking for people that will share the word with others. And so his last excuse was, I'm just telling you, pick anybody. Just get in the crowd. Pick somebody out. It would be better than me. Verse 16, so he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. And you shall take uh, this rod in your hand with which you shall do the signs. So we see all these excuses, 17 verses of excuses. And then finally, Moses says, okay, Lord, I'll do it. Now look at verse 18. We saw the call, God calls Moses to lead. Moses made up five excuses. And the last thing, Moses obeys the voice of the Lord. So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And you remember his father was a, a priest in Midian. And folks, I'm just telling you, uh, you know, as far as I know in my tree, we had no preachers, no grandfather, no great-grandfather. We had nobody that ever preached the Word of God as far as I have known. And I'm telling you, I, I just feel honored and privileged uh, now, you know, for 40 years to be a minister and a preacher of the gospel. But I'll tell you what my parents did do. My parents, every time the doors were open at Cameron Baptist Church in Lawton, Oklahoma, they had four kids in church. And that made a huge impact on my life. I chose to teach and coach when I first started and and I got into my doing my block and and you know I, you know the youth ministry opened up in the church I grew up in and God it took them nine months to get to me to even look at my application but the preacher just said you know what I think it's I, I think it's Mike Franklin you know and and folks I've been serving the Lord since and he he basically said man okay Lord whatever you want me to do I will do and Jethro said to him go in peace. As a priest of Midian, his father-in-law knew Moses had an assignment, and he knew he needed to go. Verse 19, now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, go and return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Okay, so what was that reassurance? Moses, I know you're worried about that. Folks, God knows everything about us, okay? He knew all of Moses' shortcomings, he knew the excuses that he was going to throw out, and God just kept answering them and answering them, say, "Hey, don't worry about that." The last one was, "Hey, you got Aaron. Aaron will be by your side. You are my person. You are the leader, folks." He was calling him to be the leader of of this group, leader of God's chosen people. And it says, "Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt." And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Folks, I'm telling you, God did the miracles. God used Moses to speak to Pharaoh. And as we close, I just want to give you four things, four keys to obeying God's call. All right? The, number, the first one is faith. Okay? The first one is faith. Uh, that is a key to answering God's call uh, is, is faithfulness. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17, verse 20. You remember Jesus and the disciples, he'd, he'd give them, uh, you know, that healing power. He could ca they could cast out demons uh, in, in, in Jesus' name. And they come up to this boy that uh, had epileptic fits, and he would throw himself in fires and and, you know, Peter and them could not do it. For some reason, they prayed, and they were trying to do it, and, and they wouldn't do it. So they couldn't do it. 
And, and even the disciples in verse 19 said, why could we not cast it out? Look at verse 20. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, folks, you have to believe. You have to believe God. You have to have faith. You have to believe God can do anything. God can use you. God can change things. God can change your heart. God can change people's hearts. You have to believe, which is faith. For surely I say to you, if you have the faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. i got news for you folks. We don't need to move mountains. Okay? What is he simply saying? Just a little faith is all you need. Okay? I mean, what good would be me just to move a mountain? He's expressing something that is impossible. Okay? But with God, listen to what it says, and nothing will be impossible for you. I, I still think one of the coolest things, and I'm hoping God has this huge video recorder or something up in heaven where we can see when Moses came up to the Red Sea and he looks back and he sees Pharaoh's army coming at him and he hears the children of Israel saying, oh, you brought us out here to get killed right here on the spot. We should have stayed back in Egypt. Can you imagine being there and seeing the walls of the Red Sea just open up and they walk over on dry land? Folks, that's God, folks. That's what God can do. So if we're going to obey the voice of God, we have to use faith. We have to believe he knows what he's doing and he's going to take care of us. The second thing you need, not only faith, you need trust. You need trust. Psalm 37. I know it's different on your sheet uh, because uh, Paul Walker used uh, the scripture I had already, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So I went and got me another one, all right? Psalm 37, 3 and 4. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Listen, folks, God is faithful. God is faithful. We need to understand that. And verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Folks, I'm telling you, my whole goal and my whole life when I was growing up, was to play Major League Baseball. I was on a full-ride scholarship at Cameron University there in Lawton, and, and I'm just telling you, that's, that's all I thought about. But, I, but, but God just totally changed my mind and changed my heart. Folks, if you will have faith, if you will trust God, if you just believe that He knows what He's doing, uh, He can use you mightily. Not only faith and not only trust, but also dependence. Dependence on God. Folks, I don't know about you, but I need God every single day of my life. Every day. All right? I depend on God. I depend on Him. And by the way, folks, He has never let me down. Never let me down. Philippians 4.13. Many of you can just quote this. I can do all things... And see, you, gotta, you really have to watch where you put the emphasis in here. All right? The emphasis is not on I. Okay, I, no, no, that's arrogance. Okay, I, okay, there's a lot of things I can't do. All right? I can do all things. No, not all, all things. The key word in this scripture is through. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He will always give you the strength. Folks, we've, we've had some challenging times in our life. We've had some challenging times in our ministry. I've been on mission fields where I'm, I literally go to bed exhausted, and I'm just thinking, I, I don't know that I can do this another day. We were in Mexico, and one afternoon it was 116 degrees, and we were laying tile on a church porch. And I'm telling you, two people, two men had passed out, and we were you know, we had these towels and we were wetting towels and drinking Gatorade. But we got it done before we left. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So folks, it's really, it's, it's never been about me. It's never been about you. It's about God. It's about God's kingdom. It's about God's work. 
It's about God using you for His glory. Of course, we know Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. Okay? All those situations, those times and those trials, they're for our good and for His glory. His glory. And then the last thing is just plain old obedience. We need faith. We need trust. We need dependence, and we need obedience. Genesis 22, our final scripture. Genesis 22, verse 18. In all your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And you know the story that was in front of this? Abraham and Isaac. You talk about trust. You talk about faith. Put your son, your only son, on the altar. Okay? Tie him up. He's the sacrifice. You are going to sacrifice him. And I know a lot of people said, would he really have done that? Well, folks, uh, if he raised his knife and, and he was fixing to slay his son, I would say he was. You say, well, I could never do that. Folks, you have to understand, we, we serve a God that can raise the dead. He did it. Jesus did it with Lazarus. So we are talking about fully trusting in God in all situations of life. Obeying God in all situations in life. And by the way, is that not exactly what he did with his own son? Did he not sacrifice his own son on the cross so that you and I can have salvation? You know, uh, again, most likely God's not going to call some of you men to preach overseas or have these big, huge ministries or mega churches or things like that. But I'm telling you, it's even the little things that God asks you to do. Those little things, that, those little ministries that God says, hey, there's a need here. Maybe you could help with that. Or, hey, you have this gift. Folks, we've all been given gifts. When you get saved, God gives you a spiritual gift. And part of a functioning church is using that spiritual gift for the glory of God and for His church. Father, I thank You for this night. And God, I thank You for so much for this Scripture. And God, I know we read a lot of Scripture, but God, it tells a story of a man who really messed up. He really did. He committed murder. But yet you didn't throw him away. You didn't throw him away. You didn't even lock him up. You sent him on the backside of a desert to teach him to trust you, to teach him and, and talk to him out there. And God, you even spoke to him through a burning bush. And God, I thank you for Moses' life, and I thank you for his example. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin. And God, it don't, doesn't really matter where we came from. What matters is what is going on today. What is in our life today? How can we help you today? How can we help others today? And God, I just thank you, Lord, that uh, we, we just really, uh, we don't have an excuse. God, you've given us everything we need to help your kingdom and to point others towards Jesus Christ. So God, I pray when these opportunities come up that we will say, here am I. God, I thank you for your call on my life personally, God. There was no doubt in my mind that you, you did, Lord. You called me to the youth ministry. And God, I just thank you for being able to serve uh, there for 14 years. Lord, I thank you that even here, uh, or excuse me, uh, across the river, 10 years, you allowed me to be associate pastor. And God, even here, I'm coming up on 18 years of service. And God, it's you. God, I couldn't do this. I needed you. I, we need you. We still need you in our church and in our lives. So God, I pray that we would just exercise faith. God, I pray we would continue to trust you, to have total dependence on you. Just you, Lord. Just you. And God, I pray that we will be obedient to your voice. God, I've never heard your voice audibly, 
But God, I know when you speak to me, it's that still, small voice, that Holy Spirit voice. And God, I pray that we all would be obedient servants. Thank you for this Bible study tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rye Hill Baptist Church. And may God richly bless you.